MRSA lives on a very large proportion of us. It's a colonizing organism. It's in the nostrils and on the skin of probably five or so million people in the United States at any time. And while it often just causes you know, minor skin infections, it can cause very grave infections of the valves of the heart, of the blood, of the interior of the bones, and it causes a particularly ugly kind of pneumonia called necrotizing pneumonia. At the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I was the reporter assigned to full-time coverage of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which made me the only journalist in the U.S. who was assigned to full-time coverage of the CDC. But I was so intrigued by where had this bug come from, why had I never really known very much about it before, and I kind of put that sort of in the back pocket of my mind to look at later. For a year, I did eight overnight shifts a month in emergency rooms around the country, and I started seeing MRSA everywhere. It was kind of the peak of the community epidemic. I realized something really interesting had happened from 2003 when a MRSA outbreak could call out the CDC to 2006 and 2007 when it was in every ER everywhere in the country. And that realization was really the start of this book, Superbug. It's the story of uh, a 50-year epidemic, really three overlapping epidemics of drug-resistant organisms that arose first in hospitals, then in the everyday world, and then in farming, and how those three epidemics kind of took us by surprise. One of the challenges in talking to people about MRSA has been making sure that without frightening them, that I inform them that their risks are actually closer than they know. People do not have a good sense of what they are at risk for, and so people will be fascinated by a scary disease that might actually never come to this country, but they won't wear their seatbelt when they drive to the drugstore. So I am always thinking, how do I frame what I'm going to tell them properly so that I will not frighten them and not paralyze them, but I will still honor their sort of interest and delight in the crazy things that biology can do. For me, at the beginning of my career and still, my motivation was to, to speak for those who have no voices. There are few people more voiceless uh, than people who are victims of emerging diseases. One guy has, has had his abdominal muscles so destroyed by a repeated infection that he can never pick up his grandchildren again. Those are the sort of people that I wanted to speak for.